but uh, oh, hi. we have Michigan people, but they're here in the room. Hopefully, Carol, you can join us when you're in Michigan. That would be cool mm -hmm. if, you, if you want to join up and be part of the group and see your friend and your, and your new friend. Well, do you do see things your with them? What we're, we're doing right now. What are you talking about? We're doing it right now. Yeah, so, uh, Mike, can you hit us with one, one yeah. more click? Yeah. Thank you. So, we're going to pop up the Torah today for everybody to see. Uh, uh, Joyce was kind of giving us uh, the, a rundown of the uh, a rundown of her group, the uh, grief loss support group, and the fact that she. Uh, she was talking about forgiveness in her group. And I mentioned that we talked about that last week in our group. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, today is actually a much different, uh, I would say almost the exact opposite of forgiveness, which is accountability and um, revenge, if you will. Who's putting, look at this. Who still did that? Who did that? <laughs> Who's fooling around with our Twitter? Yeah. Okay. You, but who is doing that? <laughs> I saw the screen before. No, this it is. Uh, it is I don't even right now. I'm just getting on the, uh, the Torah. Here we go. Um, that was Mike. I didn't do anything. No. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so if last week we talked about forgiveness and we talked about um, we talked about brothers forgiving each other and not doing violence to each other, this is the almost the opposite. This is a, one of the most violent stories in the Bible. Um, we're definitely gonna we're only gonna be here on this one chapter, uh, believe it or not, uh, because it is uh, it gives us a lot to talk about. It gives us a lot to reflect on, and it is an emotionally uh, draining, upsetting. Um, it's definitely, we're going to have some things to say. Some of you have read this story or heard this story before. Some of you might not have heard this story before. It is a story that we do not teach in religious school. So if the last time you read Torah was when you were 12, you never read this story. I don't know any synagogue, even today, even in the most modern whatever situation, it deals with the story with kids. It's too dis it's too disturbing. It's too upsetting. It's too violent. And um, and with that, let's take a look at the story of Dina, sometimes called the rape of Dina, uh, which kind of gives away what's about to happen. But we'll see, and it'll happen really very quick. So the 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 last thing we read in the Torah was about. Uh, Jacob and Esau reconcile. Uh -huh. They go different directions. They decide not to live together. There wasn't a decision when they simply said, hey, let's not live together. But Esau invites his brother to come with him, and he says, no, I'm not going that direction. And they essentially don't go the same place. So Esau goes back to his area where he came from, which is here, which is southern Israel, uh, the Negev, and also into Jordan. And 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 uh, basically around the Dead Sea, and Jacob goes to the city of Shechem, which, as it says, is in the land of Canaan. So this is a city. It's in modern day uh, Israel slash the West Bank slash Palestinian territories. It's the city of Nablus, which is not far from Jerusalem, but is a world away from most uh, of Israel because it is a city that is virtually 100% Palestinian today. It is not a place where Jewish tourists go. It is not a place where Jews ever really go unless they're part of the Israeli army. And the only thing that people occasionally go there for is once a month to worship at the tomb of Joseph, which is in the uh, area. Other than that, there is no reason for any Israeli, any Jew, any person pretty much who's not Palestinian to go into the area of Shechem, to go into Nablus. So that's where we left off, and that's where this story takes place. And it says, right 
right here. Dina, who, the daughter whom Leah had born to Jacob, in case you forgot, went out to visit the daughters of the land. And Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, chief of the country, saw her and took her and lay with her and disgraced her. What did they do? Being strong, well, let's get to that. Being strongly drawn to Dina, the daughter of Jacob, and in love, he spoke to the maiden tenderly. So Shechem said to his father, Hamor, get me this girl as a wife. Those are the first four verses. So what we have in these four verses is the information that we need to go on to decide whether or not a rape actually occurred here or what actually occurred here. So first of all, the guy who does this is named Shechem. It's a little confusing because that's the name of the city. Well, his father's name is Hamor, and the city is Shechem, probably because one of his ancestors, his grandfather, or one of the people from the family was named Shechem. So he's named after the city that his ancestors have established and established. It's a city that we know of. We already read about it in the time of Abraham. It's already a city that we've heard of. Um, it's a Canaanite city. Hivite is another, it's a synonym for a Canaanite. It's, it's a kind of Canaanite. So he's a Canaanite. He is not related to us through, you got to go back to Noah to be a Canaanite uh, Canaanite connection to Israel, meaning he's not like the Ishmaelites or the Edomites, the descendants of Esau or the Aram, Arameans who are descendants of Abraham's brothers. This is not a person, a Midianite, who's also descendants of Abraham. These are people that are not related to us. You have to go all the way back to them. So these are these are the native Rabbi. People. Yes. I am not hearing you distinctly. I, I it's muffled and it's not loud. Sorry. Let me... I don't know if anybody else is having difficulty, but I know I am. Oh, what? you are too, Harvey. All right. Let me try something out. Don't go anywhere, folks. All right, I won't go away. Don't be... okay, one second. Because I'm gonna try we have a new mic. Not not no, I was the mic. <laughs> You're on mic too. Turn up the volume, Mike. Everyone's gonna joke about that. Um, let me try. This is brand new, literally from today. So let me see if I can let me see if I can get this mic going. Uh, Mary has that problem too. <laughs> uh, I mean, how many more jokes are we going to do today? Who knows where you are right now? We're not going to. There's so many. There's so many more jokes that we can make. Um, anyways, let's try. I'm going to try out this. What well, could be making? <laughs> let's try this mic out. Uh, okay, here we go. How's this sound? Can you hear me better? That just then I could. Yes. How about, how about now? You got it. That's good. That's okay. much better. All right, so we're going to try this little mic out now. Um, you need a battery for the other one. This one has battery. Yeah, well, it's been charged. Uh, but somebody else had complained about it. Somebody else told me the other day that uh, this mic didn't work very good. It's just kind of dis disconcerting because we use this for services. But anyways, and it, the, the batteries are always charged. Anyways, so, you know, we, I, I actually, Mike's like really, Mike Carlin is very, strict about taking the batteries out and charging them so whatever um anyways so the, yeah so here we have um this these four lines which give us a description of what happens to dina in the first place so all we can do right now is establish what what happened in these four lines. So let's look at them uh, carefully. So it says that Dina, again, Jacob's daughter through Leah, went out to visit the daughters of the land. Now we understand this to mean that she went out and was hanging out with the Canaanite ladies, 
the other Canaanite girls, um, the natives, if you will. Now, how old was she when this happened? We don't know, but based on the fact that there are other kids that are born after her, you know, we assume that she's a, a teenager or a little bit older, maybe even. Uh -huh. There's an issue here that, uh, again, as people have read this over the ages, there's a couple things here where they, they take a issue of right away, which is why is she out hanging out with the women in the land, right? Why is she hanging out with the Canaanite ladies? Now you can make the argument, who else is she going to hang out with? Everyone else is her family. Well, needless to say, so you heard, I hope you heard, I hope you heard what Joanne said. Maybe they're teaching her a different way of cooking. Well, look, whatever they're, whatever she's doing with these women, our sages, our ancestors said somebody screwed up, somebody messed up, namely her father, or her brothers, or she did something she shouldn't have done which is she's hanging out with women that she shouldn't hang out with. Meaning she's hanging out with people that she will learn bad behavior from. She's hanging out with Canaanites, which she shouldn't have been. She shouldn't have been with them. Again, there's a question of, well, who's she going to be with? Now, I did uh, mention this before, and I don't expect anyone to remember it, but there is an interesting question of who Dina was supposed to be with. And there is a midrash, there is an understanding that she was supposed to have been by this point married. Mm. Now, who's she going to marry? Because technically, really, the only people that she can marry that are non-Canaanites is like somebody within her own family. Well, who do the guys marry? The boys marry? So what's interesting is, yeah, her older brothers, right? Her brothers who were already there, who would they marry? Well, the midrash is that the other... The other daughter for every son. Correct, which means that Dina's, uh, you know, uh, Leah's kids married Rachel's kids and vice versa. So at least they were half brother and sister, not full brother and sister. That to the ancient, the ancient peoples was more, more appropriate than her being with a Canaanite. But that's what it probably happened. I don't know, because the reality is, is that the older brothers, Reuben and all those people, they could have married people back in Iran. They could have married other Laban people, True. right? So they could have married other Arameans, the people that are like cousins, people that are related to Rachel, Leah, and Bilha, and Zilpah. They could have married other Arameans. At least those are descendants of Abraham. So that's a possibility. The interesting thing about this is the rabbis actually say that Leah either could have been with one of her half siblings or even more important and even maybe more appropriate because they're not siblings at all is that she should have been married off to Asaph. To what? Asaph, her uncle. Now what's weird about that of course is that it's her uncle but that is a legal marriage but the bigger issue is that Asaph by, be by being married to Dina would have been brought back into the fold that somehow again Esau would have not gone off the rails and would have not left the community if he could have been married to Dina. So there is this understanding that Dina actually got hidden by Jacob. Jacob never let Esau even set eyes on Dina because he'd want to marry her and he should have married her. So there's an understanding that he hired, he hid her when they were coming over and we just read about him splitting up his family. He hid her. But wasn't he already married and had children? Yes. Okay. He did already have, he already, but so did Jacob. Jacob had four wives. So the fact that Esau could have had another wife, at least this wife would have been a good wife. Remember, he first marries Canaanite women and his mom and dad get mad at him. Remember, that's what, one of the reasons why Jacob went off in the first place was because Isaac and Rebecca said, yeah, get out of here. There's no one here you can marry. So Esau already did that. And remember what Esau did after he saw his parents were mad. He married one of Ishmael's daughters, which again, at least they're related, right? At least they're through Abraham. So there is this understanding that Dina was somewhat messed up by the fact that her father didn't do what he should have done, which is get her married off to someone at least somehow connected, 
or even more so, what she, why did he let her hang out with these other women? And so there is an understanding here that, that this was to some extent Jacob's fault. What? Yes. Was there bisexuality that early in the Bible? Not that would have helped them. So, so Carol's question was if there was bisexuality, it, but how would that have helped Dina? Yeah. How would that have helped Dina? It's an interesting question, but how would that have helped? We, by the way, from what we know, maybe not, because again, as, as Mike said, there's a midrash that Jacob had daughters. Every time he had a son, he had a daughter, which is where these other sons got women from. That's a weird midrash, but it is. But the only daughter that we actually read about Jacob having, the only daughter the Bible says that she had is Dina, yeah. which is weird, but it's possible. He had 11 sons by this point. Benjamin's not married, which is weird too, by the way, because we haven't read about Benjamin's birth. But Benjamin will be the 12th son it so says there's 12 sons and one daughter it's possible people have done it i mean some people would have said that's a really high uh very the the probability on that is is pretty you know that's kind of astronomical but it's possible anyways the point is is that she has not been married off she is not protected and she goes out now there's another understanding a possibility which is that she didn't have permission to go out she went out when it says that she went out, which it says she went out, that she took the initiative. Doesn't say he let her go. <laughs> it says she went out. So did she have permission to go out? She might not. Now, this is a little problematic, by the way, too, to some extent, because this is one of the arguments. This is one of those times where, where, where we seem to be perhaps blaming the victim. And there is some of that traditional understanding here with Dina, which is that she put herself into this situation where this could happen. She was at the wrong place. Yep. She was at the wrong place at the wrong time. She was hanging out at the wrong kind of bar. She shouldn't have been hanging out with those kind of people. So there is that understanding. Now, I will tell you that this is actually a serious issue because for the last at least 2,000 years, maybe 2,500 years, this story was held up as an example of why Jewish girls should not be hanging out with the wrong kind of guys. I'm not joking. I mean, this was a story from Genesis. And so it's literally like an example of why you don't let your daughters hang out with <coughs> Gentiles, why you don't let your daughters go to college or go to and even before that, to be in an environment where they're with people that are not other Jews. This is a serious issue. I, I will tell you, there are generations of Jewish women that were not allowed to do things that their brothers did. And I'm talking about not a thousand years ago either, which it did. I'm talking about right now at this moment. There, there are religious Jews who do not let their daughters go to university or go to places where they're going to be at at risk and the justification for it is this story it's this line and so when people read this and they go well is this relevant well it's relevant to some people who still live by this and they say look dina was dina was in a situation where she could no longer be protected and you don't want your daughter to be in that situation so this is literally held up right now as justification for why, for why Jewish women in some cases are not allowed to do the things that are their brothers do. I know, I know people are going to say that's unbelievable it is a hundred percent what happens right now. Uh, by the way, it's not like the boys necessarily always got to do things that their, their sisters didn't because there is this understanding that you hang out with Canaanite type people it's not good for the boys either. You don't want them to behave like this. So you don't want to behave like Esau or like some of the people who started behaving could were descendants of Abraham, but end up going off in the wrong direction. So this is a real issue for people. The story is still read. Jacob and his brothers, uh, and his brother, uh, Joseph and his brothers, these stories are still read as lessons for the way people should live their lives and the people who the decisions of who you should interact with so when it says in the next verse that shechem 
chief of the country, saw her and took her and lay with her and disgraced her. Those words, those verbs, saw her, saw her, that's the first verb, took her and lay with her, all happened. And then it says, and she was disgraced. That's the last verb. So there's three verbs that, technically speaking, are not necessarily bad. There's no justification or, I mean, no uh, judgment on seeing her, taking her, and laying with her. That's great. Why? Why do you think? Taking her? Yeah. Not a good thing. So, so Mike is saying that the, the taking her is indicative of something that, that is... Uh, I go to a store and I take something. Yeah. And get arrested. So, so the only issue is, is that in other places, the word vaikach, that he took her and lay with her, is not necessarily... In, in, the, in those contexts is not necessarily always bad. So taking someone for the purposes of sex is not always goes hand, it doesn't always go hand in hand with violence. And it doesn't always, and I, you think it could I'm because, no, 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 I, I know what you're saying. So, so it can, and it definitely could be possibly a problem. But it's not always a problem. So sometimes I can take you to a dance. Well, not you. I understand, but sometimes when you take somebody in the Bible, he by Stoke, he took his wife and lay with her. That is a sense of just that by itself is sexual. So yes, it could be. The point is, is that the point is, is that. There's no question that in the last verb, and he disgraced her, right. or the other word could be, Mary, what's your translation? Defiled. Yeah. So oh, Mary's, Mary's King James says defiled. Yeah. It's pretty clear that it's so not the, consensual if, or... If you uh, translate the Hebrew, what would you translate? Um, I would... If I were going to translate that, I actually wouldn't go either of those directions. I would, I would translate it as, well, I would, I think I would translate it as, and he, uh, I don't know if forced himself on her would be the best translation, but but um, I would say either forced himself or or it's tough because Definitely negative. Yeah, but it's tough because there's also that root is also used for any kind of sexual mm. even even it doesn't have to be. It's definitely sexual. I, actually, it's not always sexual, but in this con context, definitely sexual. But it's but that word is is used as also to um, to force or to or to compel, and so I don't know if it's always it, it. I mean, it's not always bad, but it's almost always the person that that happens to. But it's weird because in Hebrew, the word ona is also used for the sexual obligation that somebody has. It's it's almost always in this context. It's it, I would say it's pretty negative, which is why it's almost always translated as in some way negative, defiled, dis, uh, disgraced, um, abused. I don't know. There's probably other words that I'm not even thinking of that they, that you'll see translations of. It's always it, th this is almost always translated as a negative. I don't know if there's any way. To translate this as not as not negative, though there are readings of this where the understanding here at the end of the of that line isn't that she was raped, the the sex might have not been appropriate. The the most you can say where where Shechem doesn't do something terrible to her 
is that the sex wasn't done according to what should have happened, which is there should have been some type of agreement that this was a relationship that the families recognized, meaning essentially that the father gave permission for this, because that is without question. Uh, there is no knowledge that anybody or agreement or knowledge that anybody had that this was a, a consensual relationship. Was it consensual to her, of course, is the big question that we asked today. People didn't ask that question two generations ago, three generations ago. I guess there's probably people who don't ask that question right now. Well, there are still countries today yeah. that women, um, no matter what the women say or do, they're always the guilty one. Yeah, yeah. And there are some cultures we know where the women are punished with death for allowing themselves to be raped or being raped, the honor killings that go on. So our understanding of this, where we're trying to figure out was, was, was it consensual for a lot of people, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it was consensual right now. So um, it is weird that, you know, we, we read this today with a whole different, with a whole different, um, with a whole different uh, look to this, uh, the the new international version says raped her. That's what the new international version, which is not a Jewish translation. The new revised standard version, which I happen to like a lot, that's an English translation that's um, got a pretty good uh, consideration for what the actual Hebrew is. I like this one. He seized her. Yeah, yeah, that makes he seized her. Yeah. Because that's yeah. more like the compelled. That's almost like a kidnap. Yeah. Well, yeah. the way it must have been, it wouldn't have gone with him willingly. Yeah. But then the disgrace isn't there necessarily, but there's not consent. Uh the revised the so the new revised has what what the revised standard version was the older version has the Wait same. If you were saying that then, then you're saying that she didn't lay with him willingly he he made her yeah yeah uh yeah well there definitely doesn't seem to be her consent in that okay. um i just want to see if any of them here's the new american bible which is the new catholic translation well they they, they actually put on the top of this the the rape of dina so i think you're going to know what they're going to say here well we also know what's going to go on later on too yeah Jeff. yeah but 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 the question is, is what actually happens at the beginning like what are the words the, the new american bible. it's funny how everybody has a different translation by the way the new american bible has the only one that was the same was the revised and the new revised standard which i i think was separated by about 30 years of translation uh but same people same authorization new american bible which is uh, the newer catholic version has lay with her by force which isn't as poet it's not as uh it's a little it's a little um cumbersome but it's, it it's almost a, sounds like it's a, it's a good translation yeah lay with her by force definitely is the is i think the uh, the, the root ana which is to compel or to or to um, it goes with their philosophy better uh, yeah but it's their also theology. a good it's also a good hebrew though it's a good hebrew translation now that's the word ana so it's as i said it's translated in many different ways we just saw them. rape disgrace defiled by force seized those are all translations none of them have any sense that she agreed to this so that with that last word because up until that it's all him and then well even the last word is all him but her consent could have been implied with those words because there are other times where a person's and again he sees her falls in love with her takes her whatever now it has not said that he loves her yet except for the next line the next line the word right after he disgraced her or he, he seized her is he was strongly drawn to her. And the translation from this is va tedabek naf show, which is his soul was bound to her or stuck to her. What's the King James on that one, Mary? His soul lay unto Dina. Yep, his soul. So the English translation we have here doesn't translate soul it has strongly drawn which is i'm not wild about that translation and if it's a really not great translation i will tell you it's not a great translation but 
the point here is that he likes her and his soul is the word got back means to like be glued. It's where the word divot comes from, right? In Yiddish, the, the demon that possesses you, which is interesting, by the way, because there does seem to be an emotion or a reaction here, which is almost not love. It's, it's almost an obsession, right? And so the word divic is a possession. It's a possession that you have with a spirit or a demon that comes into you. The word dabek means this, this, this was like attached to him. Her soul became attached to him. It became stuck to him. Um, all of those words, uh, that is what it says at first, that his soul was drawn to her or stuck to her. Okay, that is more of an obsession. That is more, I can't get her out of my mind. She's uh, my soul, her soul is in me and I'm thinking about her. More of an obsession. But the next verb says, he was in love with the maiden. He was in love with her. Vaya ahav, which is the word ahava, right? It sounds like a stalker. Used is love. He was in love with her. And it says, vaya ber al lev. He spoke to her with his heart. I'm sure the King James Version, Mary, gave us the word heart in there. No? Um, it says he loved the damsel and spoke with her. Oh. Uh, they didn't translate the word lev. They didn't translate the word lev as heart. But you know the word lev. The word lev means heart. The whole of Abcha with all of our heart. Now, remember, lev isn't just it isn't just our hearts, it's also our minds, which is why sometimes we translate the word lev as heart or mind, or heart and mind is it sometimes translated today. But it is interesting. Lev, though, is the heart, mind, whatever. It's our it's our passions, it's our intellect. I don't know, folks. This is a this is a real love. This is this is a love that he has for her. What about her well, it's very interesting. It's a very interesting thing. Uh, he spoke affectionately to her as one of the other translations from, again, back to the New American Bible and the New Revised Standard. Why are these translations so important? Because it's really important to understand. What do we think about this? What do we think about what just happened? What do we think about, if we, can, if we don't know what the words are, we're not really sure how we're supposed to react to this is this a rape or is this a relationship that was not supposed to happen um, don't you get the feeling it's like a stalker um yes yeah i feel like I'm captured in a movie or something and i love you you know <laughs> she's not necessarily on board with this there definitely um, seems to be that so how are they biblically defining rape? Is rape when a woman says no, or is rape when they haven't gotten permission of the father? Well, I think it's the latter. I think, I, I, I look, we know that the, the Bible says flat out, and the Torah says, I mean, it's in Deuteronomy, that you're not allowed to take a woman by force without essentially giving her the bride price for taking her. So without, right. you can't, there is a financial consequence if you take a woman and lay her you know that the torah tells us that now so it's irrelevant how he feels about her because because he didn't get permission therefore it's defined as a rape correct not, well, it doesn't matter what she feels for him or what he feels for her without her father's permission she's been raped yes this is absolutely correct because we're talking right now about today but you know, 3,000 years ago, it was a lot different what great means. I mean, I, yeah. I think this does talk to his intention of, of it, but it, had he really shown her the respect or his, you know, he would have gone to, or, I mean, had he shown her father the respect, he would have gone directly to the father. But What's interesting, yeah, everybody's right. But what's interesting about this is that the Bible takes the point of telling you didn't have to tell us that he loved her because you're right. It's really at the end of the day irrelevant because he didn't do it the right way. He didn't take her the right way, which again, the rabbis point out, that's what, what else would you expect from a Canaanite, right? So this is the kind of behavior that happens with these people. 
But it really, you're right, it doesn't matter. But yet the Torah tells us that he loved her. Is it in the Canaanite custom to ask for the, the father's permission? Or maybe that just wasn't their custom and it was the custom of her, her family's custom? Well, what's interesting is that we did read this line, which is that he says to his father, Hamor, get me this girl as a wife. So he says to his father, I want to marry this woman. Now, that's easy to say after you've had sex with her. I mean, you could say he's doing the right thing. But it does interestingly tell us that his father was the one who had to negotiate, right? So the fact that it tells us that he goes to his father and says, get me this girl's wife, means that he has to go through the procedure of getting her. He can't go to the father directly. He can't go to Jacob. He has to have his father go to Jacob and ask for him. The it makes it feel a little more Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> well, again, you asked the question. You made the point. Is there, is this uh, because they didn't do it the proper way? Or is it because she was raped? And if, it, if it's the first, now I reversed it. But if it's the fact that they didn't do it according to the procedure, then the Torah is essentially telling us, it doesn't matter. I mean, you could say, well, that's with Canaanites. I don't think so. The Torah is basically saying it doesn't matter if the guy loves her. If he didn't do it the right way, he already screwed up. And, and maybe it doesn't he, matter that he loves her. And maybe he's, he's young enough that his father's doing the negotiation. Why is his father doing the negotiation instead of him? Doesn't that make it seem like maybe they're both young? No, it could be that that's the way you had to do it. That you, in order for a marriage to take place, you had to have a negotiation between the parents. Laser. Yeah, between, yes, yes, Mike says, Laser and Tevya. It was probably, in all cultures, it definitely seems like, it, he doesn't say, Father, get me the girl's wife because you have to negotiate because that's the way the, the Israelites do it. It's not the way that, the, that these people do it. He seems to be telling them, this is the way we do it. You do it. He doesn't say, there's no comment here at all that, well, we, we better go through their channels, right? We better go through their proper channels. It is, it is, do this, dad, and uh, it's almost like now he's trying to fix, he's trying to fix the problem. However, did he even ever think there was a problem? Because what if he just slept with her and just said, I don't care. I, I, I don't, who's, who is this Israelite girl? Who's this uh, daughter of Jacob? I don't need to, they're, they're nomads. These are people that are way well beneath us. That's what he could have said. I mean, we have to remember, we're reading it from our side, which is the Jacob side, but the Canaanite side is, who cares about this riffraff nomad that came in with his family that's living outside of our city walls and these people are low class nomads. I have a better question. Yeah. How do we know about this story? He's telling the story. How do we know that the story really happened? Who's telling us the story? Who's narrating the story? So, who's telling us this story? Well, interestingly, we are kind of thinking about that as we're reading in our Tuesday morning class or as we're reading the stories from Genesis, because I made the point yesterday as we're reading these stories. They really remind us of some of the things that happened in the book of Samuel and the story of King right. David. And these stories of people marrying people off kind of without their permission or doing things like, again, as we read yesterday, Saul marrying off his daughter Michal to King David. Um, I read some of the stuff that King David does. There's some of these stories that, that are very reminiscent. And when we see them in Genesis, they almost seem to be like the backstories for the behaviors of people during the time of King David. So is there a story here that parallels nicely with the things in King David's world? Uh, yeah, there are some stories that, that harken back to this in these, this chapter and the next couple of chapters. Yeah, there definitely are some stories that get into um, doing things the wrong way, including, again, taking women that are not your wife or sleeping with people uh, and then fixing the situation after you already did it. So, so uh, this story in these first few verses already gives us a lot to think about. This is not, the story 
is um, to first establish what happens. I mean, now we get into the consequences. So get me this girl as a wife is what uh, Shechem says. Interestingly, uh, well, let's look at what, what happens. So it says that Jacob heard that he had defiled his daughter, Dina. But since his sons were in the field with his cattle, Jacob kept silent until they came home. Now here the word defiled is time, which is tame, which is the word that we use for something that's impure. The connotation there is definitely one of defilement and pure rendering something into a state that isn't good. It's not good to be Tame. But it's it's almost a ritual. Why are you guys recording this? Because this is an important moment. One second. Please start your recording. Somebody else's phone right now or or, uh, computer. So what happens here is that Jacob hears about it before the brothers hear about it. And so he has to uh, what is that? He has to come up with a solution for uh, what to do but he doesn't do anything until his sons come home so it says that jacob did not do anything until they came home so he knows about it first that's what it says so he hears about it through the grapevine which means he hears about it to some extent, before the, the marriage offer comes forward. And it doesn't say he hears that Hamor is coming a, along with a marriage proposal. What it says is that he hears that, oh, this guy defiled his daughter. That's not what he, he does not hear, hey, my daughter's about to get married. Won't this be wonderful? He hears that his daughter is defiled. Now, did he hear the story the way we heard it? Or did he hear it another way? Because if he heard it the way we heard it, and he takes away from it that she was defiled, because that word wasn't used before. He doesn't, we don't hear that he hears that the guy loves her. Doesn't say that. It only says that his daughter was defiled. Is it even relevant? I don't know. Maybe again, that's a modern question we're asking. Is Jacob, will Jacob care that the guy likes her? Maybe he's irrelevant. Maybe Jacob heard it and doesn't care. As far as he's concerned, the only thing he knows is that his daughter has had sex with this guy. And now she's, in her in his mind, defiled. Maybe it's important that there's no bride price being paid. Maybe. I mean, Esau just slept with, with Rebecca, but a bride price was paid before. I mean, Jacob. I mean, yeah, yeah. Isaac, you said Isaac. I, I'm sorry, Isaac. Yeah, yeah, but a bride price had been... Yeah. Really so wonderful. up until this point, anybody in our family, in the family of Abraham, etc., they go through the proper channels of establishing bride price, taking care of all that, getting permission from the father, and then there's that's when the relationship happens after that. Again, it, it, maybe it's irrelevant. Maybe he heard everything, And it still doesn't matter to him because the only thing he hears is that somebody slept with my daughter. That's all that he cares about. So So I I think women at this point are property. As far as he's concerned, someone has has not paid the bride price. It could be. And it could be that he heard it differently. But it it is possible that somebody came to him and said, hey, you know, that guy slept with your daughter. Not this guy slept with your daughter, is in love with her, and his father's coming to ask you for marriage. Because... If that's what's happening, maybe he's already saying, oh, we're going to fix this. All we know so far is that he heard that this happened. Yeah, he might have heard it from Dina him, herself, you know. Just to say that, Sarah, what if Dina was the one who told him? What if Dina was the one who reported back what happened? Doesn't say that, by the way. Doesn't say that. Doesn't say that. I mean, I, I tend to think that she didn't tell him. We don't know, by the way, that Dina's even there. Dina could still be with him. 
We don't know that Dean has ever come home. All we know is that his sons aren't home and he's by himself. Or if he's not by himself, he's with his wives, he's with the kids, he's with some of the younger kids. All we know is that he isn't going to do anything yet. See, I tend to think that um, that the the uh, Shechem is is what's the name of the the guy who was with her? Um, Shechem. Yeah. Okay. Shechem is younger because Jacob is can negotiate for himself for his wives, but Isaac can't negotiate for himself. He they send a um, uh, he sends a messenger Let's, in, in his father's stead, right? So maybe wait, Shechem is. Wait. What I mean, didn't um, Eliezer go to uh, somebody? You're went talking, on you're talking about when Isaac, yes, yeah. Isaac, but that was Isaac didn't negotiate on his own behalf, or right, Abraham, but, exactly. But Jacob negotiated on his behalf, so I'm just wondering if, if there is a certain age when you are a man and like old enough where you can negotiate on your own behalf for a wife. Yeah, but the issue is Isaac was older than Isaac was was. 37, assumedly, when they negotiate for, for... Yeah, but there's no real evidence to show that he was really that age. I mean, it's just the assumption uh, if we can no, see... Uh, his, mother, his mother had just died. She was 90. I mean, if you do the math, you're right. So maybe he was younger. We don't know. Oh, I mean, okay, just, yeah. It was he doesn't, he seem, died. doesn't seem like he's a kid. The question of how old Rebecca is is more troubling because, again, based on the Torah... We hear about Rebecca being born at the end of chapter 22 of, of Genesis. I mean, you know, literally right after the Akedah. So if if Isaac is in his 30s when the Akedah happened and and she's just born there, then she's a little girl, a 10-year-old, 13-year-old girl, maybe, when oh yeah, Isaac comes there. And I will tell you that there is an understanding that that's how old she was. I don't think that's the way it has to be, but technically speaking, we don't hear about Rebecca being born until the last paragraph of the Akedah story in chapter 22. And of course, oh. um, Isaac is not there to negotiate on behalf of, of um, Jacob for the daughters. Yep. So, He's not around. That's right. He's okay, not. So there. maybe it doesn't matter how old they are. Could be. And again, in this case, the importance to some extent is that he hears about it before there's ever a negotiation. So here's now the negotiation. Then Shechem's father, Hamor, came out to Jacob to speak to him. Now, what's interesting here is it's the same word, Vayetse Hamor. Now, the, the portion began, this chapter began with Vayetse Dina, that Dina went out. Now it's Hamor went out, and he came out to meet Jacob and to speak to him. Meanwhile, Jacob's sons, having heard the news, came in from the field. The men were distressed and very angry because he had committed an outrage in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing not to be done. Now, there is no question that as far as the brothers are concerned, this was wrong. It says they were mad. It says that they had a reason to be mad. It says it's a thing that's not to be done. It's not to be done. Now, we haven't said this yet, and I don't even know that we have to say this, but I will say this. This is Shechem. This is the prince of the town. There is no more important kid in town than this kid. The town is named, he's named after the town, or the town's named after him, or whatever's going on. This is the most powerful family in the town. They're the king of the town. They're the prince of the town. These are the guys who run the town. So there's a power dynamic here too which is that Jacob and his family, even though Jacob's been promised this land, as far as the people who are living behind the gates of Shechem, these people have no power whatsoever. And if you're not clear about that, we'll hear it in a couple verses. Jacob is completely at a disadvantage here. The sons are upset, and we know that right away. It says they're upset. By the way, they also hear about it before their father has a chance to talk to them about it. It says they heard the news and they came in from the field. And so they heard about it, meaning that Jacob maybe didn't have a chance to discuss it with his sons yet, and they heard about it from somebody else. Now, before we just say, well, what does that matter? It does matter because human behavior being what it is, 
there's a very different situation that if this was not something that was known or discussed, how the family would have reacted. To some extent now, there is a problem in that people know that this has happened. If people are already talking about it, it means that the brothers are dealing with the shame that's come on to them and to their family by what had happened. So if this was only being discussed between the families, maybe the brothers wouldn't have been so upset. They would have maybe been upset, but not as upset as they were, because now they have to deal with the fact that there are people talking about them. And that absolutely affects people's behavior. When people feel that they've been publicly humiliated, their reaction to the situation becomes disproportionately. And everybody can think about this in their own lives or in things you've heard about it with other people. Are people reacting to what happened or to the fact that people know that it happened? We all know that that's happened before. There are things that we can tolerate and that we deal with that are really, really bad that could potentially be catastrophic and very shameful uh-huh. if people knew about it. Exactly. If it's behind closed doors, we can deal with stuff and we can stomach stuff. We can personally stomach things that we can't if they're publicly known. And in some cases, there's things that we won't stomach and they're not nearly as grievous or as shameful. But once they're publicly known, we react in a way that's not proportionate to the way we should. Because what, what I'm saying is this, if, you, if, if, if we have a secret that's our secret and it's a horrible secret that we don't want anybody to know, we might be able to live with it. But if something that was not even as bad as that becomes known outside, our reaction is going to be crazy because other people know about it. And so is this what happens to Jacob? Is this what happens to the brothers? It's hard to know. But the fact that people are talking about it, that they hear about it before they hear about it, maybe from their sister or maybe from their dad, or maybe from the parties involved, definitely before Hamor has a chance to talk to them, the damage is already done, I think. So now comes, let's fix this. Hamor spoke with them saying, my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him in marriage. Intermarry with us, give us your daughter, give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. You will dwell among us and the land will be open before you. Settle, move about it and acquire holdings in it. Marry with us, not just Dina, but all of your families. Become part of our people, intermarry with us and you can live here. You can own property here. You don't have to be strangers anymore. You're not going to be nomads. You're not going to have to ask for permission to live in the land. It'll be your land. You buy it. You'll, you'll be able to have holdings. You'll be able to own property. You'll be able to own houses. You won't be nomads. You won't have to ask for permission to go through someone's field. You can own it. Now, of course, we know it's kind of a joke because Jacob was already promised this land by God. Isaac was already promised his land by God. Abraham was already promised his land by God. But they have no way of exercising that. They have not nearly enough people. And they're in no position to say, well, guess what, Shechem? Guess what, Hamor? It's already our place. They're not going to do that. There's no way they're going to do that. So and now that- marriage is a great way to acquire land. Yep. yep. And so the bride price here is huge. Because the bride price here is we'll give you permission to literally live amongst us. We're going to make, we're going to make a pact that goes beyond just a family. It's going to be for everybody in, the, in your community and my community. We're all going to live together happily ever after. Seems pretty good. Seems like a good, seems like it's a good deal. And he starts off right away by my son, Shechem longs for your daughter. There is no mention, by the way, of, Maybe he didn't do it in the right way. There's no recognition. And again, he's the king, so we wouldn't necessarily expect him to show any 
sense of humility or sense of, you know, what their family did that was wrong. But regardless, he starts off with my son longs for your daughter. And please, he asks him, nah, says, please, Tanuna, please give her, you know, please give her to him in marriage. Um, it doesn't seem like a bad deal. And there at least is recognition. Yeah, and he uses the same soul word. Um, his his soul is with your with your daughter. Yes. Yes. Here the word is nafsho. Ha, yeah, but it's hashka nafsho. That they it's it's a it's a slightly different verb than dabek, which is to glue, oh. but it's, it's longing. What's the translation you've got, Mary, for that longing for or desiring? The soul yeah, longs. So that's a, the King James has longs. It's a, it's a, it's a desires, longs, pines for. I mean, you know, it's good. I mean, it, it's it's the right thing to say. I mean, he definitely doesn't open up with, "Hey, by the way, my son." slept with your daughter without permission. He doesn't say that. Again, maybe that's part of the problem is he doesn't recognize that he's, his son has done anything wrong. Again, we're dealing with the power dynamic here where would we expect him to? Would he think he have to? I mean, you know, he slept essentially with a nomadic girl. He doesn't have any power. I mean, we know She's Jacob's daughter, but that doesn't mean anything to him more. You know, but he's also willing to give of his daughters, which tells me he must think something of Jacob. I mean, that he also is willing to, I mean, he could he could trade his daughters off to acquire more land or bigger communities or whatever, but he's willing to give them to Jacob, so uh, Jacob's family. Correct. Unless he I has like 100 daughters, so who knows? I will tell you that the word that's used here is exactly what i was trying to tell you before where it says give give us your daughters and tikhu lachem take them so the word lakach there to take tikach is the same verb where it says he took her it doesn't have any connotation there of taking by force so as i said taking the word lakach or tikach to take isn't necessarily have any connotation of a bad thing. Taking is not the force. Taking is what you do in this case here, where it says, take our daughters, take my wife, please. Take them to be your wife, please. Uh, that's the word, tikhu, which means to take in marriage. And by the way, we still use that word. I take you in marriage. The, the connotation there is never by force. I take this woman in marriage, right? It's, you know, I, it's a fancy way of saying we're getting married. It's not, we don't use that phrase today without, you know, recognizing it's like a traditional way of saying it, but we still, t I take her hand in marriage, right? So that's the, 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 the making good part. It seems okay. There doesn't, there doesn't seem to be anything wrong here other than maybe there's no admission of guilt. Though I would say you wouldn't expect it, probably. That's what he says, okay? Hamor does the negotiation, right? Shechem doesn't say anything. Again, Shechem also doesn't say, I made a mistake, I should have asked for permission. There's none of that. But would we have expected it? Now, Shechem does come up now and say, Shechem said to her father and brothers, right? Do me this favor and I will pay whatever you tell me. Ask of me a bride price ever so high, as well as gifts, and I will pay what you tell me. Only give me the maiden for a wife. Uh, let's just look at those two lines. So now Shechem speaks up. So Hamor did the negotiation exactly the way you're supposed to do. And now Shechem jumps in. Now this is significant. Because number one, we well, we already know that he really loves her. But he actually does something here that he shouldn't have done. He put himself in a really bad position right here. The negotiation is going kind of along the lines of the way a negotiation would have gone. 
father comes to the other father and says, I'd like to work out the terms of the marriage. And all of a sudden the son jumps in now here and says, ask anything you want. I'll pay it. When you go in to buy a car, you don't go in and say, whatever you want for the car, I'll give it to you. You don't do that. That's not the way you negotiate. So probably at this point, if they're sitting at the table, the father's kicking them under the table going, shut up. We had terms. The terms were going great. Don't say anything more. Why are you talking? There's no reason for Shechem to say this other than the fact that he really wants to marry. And he says, do me this favor. I want, you know, and, he, and the words are, again, this phrase we've had a lot, this is let me find favor in your eyes. Isn't that what the translation, what does the King James say? Let me find grace. Let me find, grace. Let me find favor. Again, the word chan, chena, chana grace or favor let me find grace in your eyes let me do just cut me a break do something for me that you don't have to do let you know give me a break do me this favor is a good translation that captures the essence here which is i need your help and he says i will pay whatever you want just tell me what it is What is the King James for ever so high? What do you think that, what does that say, Mary? Ask for me a bride price in 12. Yeah. So the King James says, as you, as you say to me, so you name the price, whatever it is, I'll pay it. That's what Shechem just said. I will pay whatever you ask for. Again, not the way to negotiate for something. You pretty much just, just shot the whole negotiation. You have no power. You have no ability to, to negotiate at that point. He opened the, the door. It was not where maybe Hamor was intending to go. Now, it could be that Shechem sees at that point where Hamor is talking to him that they, he doesn't see that the family is willing to budge. So when Shechem jumps in there, he's already seen that the brothers are like shaking their heads or they're walking away. They're not interested in making the deal. So he wants to close the deal. Correct. So maybe Shechem here is grasping for straws and he's begging them, please just cut me a break. I'll do anything. I'll, I'll pay anything. All we know right now is that he's completely given up his power in this negotiation. He is not, he's not, he does not care. Just get me what I want. So I want this woman as my wife. And this is the opening that the boys need. Jacob's sons answered Shechem and his father Hamor, speaking with guile because he had defiled their sister Dina. And said to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to a man who is uncircumcised, for that is a disgrace among us. That word, harefa, is, is definitely a disgrace. Embarrassment. Only on this condition will we agree with you, that you will become like us, and that every male among you is circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you and you can take our daughters to, your, to ourselves and we can take your daughters to ourselves and we will dwell among you and become as one kindred. So that is the answer that they come up with. That the brothers said, right? Jacob's sons. It doesn't say Jacob said this. We have no knowledge of whether Jacob was thinking this. Jacob wanted anything more than what was offered already. But the brothers now are able to get what they want. Now we know already, because the Torah just told us, that they have no intention of negotiating in good faith. So the, the Torah told us that. The father negotiating, even though he knew she was great, so that 
Who that who would know? Her father. Jacob? Yeah. Uh, we don't know. Uh, because as you notice right here, Jacob never said a word. Jacob never said anything. Jacob has not said a word this entire time. He hasn't said a word. Moore spoke, Shechem spoke, and the brothers just spoke. Jacob has not said a word yet. He didn't say anything. And it says right here that they were speaking with guile. What is the, what's the King James translation on speaking with guile? On? Deceitfully. That's also good. The Hebrew is the Mary Ma, that he sp that they were speaking with no intention of going through with this. Or that there's a trick here. We're told that. We, we as the readers already know that this is a trick. We know that. Just like we knew that Isaac was that not going to be sacrificed. We knew that that was a test for Jake, for Abraham. We know that the, the, the sons, the boys, the, the, I mean, they're men, they just, they're pulling a fast one. We know that. So lest anybody say, well, they hadn't made up their minds yet that only some of the guys were going to do this killing. Well, I ruined it already. But I ruined the end of the story. It's not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story anyways. It's the climax. Of the story. <laughs> but we know, we, lest anybody think that this was uh, only a couple of the brothers deciding what to do, it says right here that the brothers answered, the Jacob's sons answered, that this is what you got to do. And then, of course, it's not just it's going to be okay for them. It'll be okay. Yeah, we'll go ahead with this, this intermarriage pact. Yeah, it's all good for us after that. Right? Um, and what is this all about? It is a disgrace for us to marry off to men that are uncircumcised. Well, interestingly, we just read about the uncircumcised Philistines yesterday. The Canaanites also being uncircumcised becomes a part of this week's story. So it's good, it's a good matchup. The uncircumcised Canaanites and the uncircumcised Philistines that surround the Israelites. And of course, the circumcision here becomes the key part of the story. It becomes the it becomes the um, the uh, device for this uh, tale key device um, and they said then we will give our daughters to you and you take our daughters to ourselves and we'll dwell among you as one kindred but if you will not listen to us and become circumcised we will take our daughter and go so what does that tell us we don't want to go through with the deal she's leaving we're taking her and we're leaving But they planned that all along. Uh, no, that is interesting. No, because what, what Mike's saying is in verse 14, it says to give our sister to a man is uncircumcised. And then it says, but if you will not listen to us, we will take our daughter and go. Our daughter meaning brother's Correct. So they're speaking on behalf of their father because as we've said right. so far, Jacob has not said a word. He's still not said a word, right? He's still not said a word. Jacob has not said anything. It's pretty crucial, by the way, for this story that Jacob doesn't say anything. Now, I will tell you this. Yes, they used the word sister before and the word daughter back. Now, they've used the word daughter. What's interesting about this is that the line actually works because of this reason. They juxtaposed, and it's a really clever thing that they did. And this is why I tell you why Genesis is such a beautiful, well-written book. And there's words in here that you're like, 
Well, why did it use that word? Look at this, look at this phrase. We will give our daughters to you and take your daughters to ourselves, and we will dwell among you and become one kindred. But if you do not listen to us and become circumcised, we will take our daughter and go. And so what's interesting here is they didn't use sisters in there because essentially that's, that's irrelevant. It's not the sister. You don't, you don't negotiate on behalf of this other sister. You do as you're with your daughters, right? So our daughters can marry your daughters, which assumedly means that the fathers will have these negotiations in the future, that our daughters and your daughters will be able to be married off to each other through agreements that the fathers make here. And what's interesting about this is that now they say, and if that doesn't happen, if that doesn't happen, if the circumcisions doesn't, if the, those circumcisions don't take place, this daughter is going. And that's really powerful the way they said it, because they're talking about daughters. And then they said, and this daughter is out of here. Well, they're saying circumcisions. Aren't they really doing conversion? Well, hold on, hold, hold off that on that one. But do you understand what they did that was so poetic? Is that they actually did it? Because it's a really interesting. Like you'd almost not even notice that if Mike hadn't pointed that out, we would have just said, "Well, it said sisters there," and, and we wouldn't have even noticed it said daughters. There. But it's, it works because of the the way that they just the way they just laid it out. The daughters, okay, fine. This daughter out of here. And Mike just said, "Well, isn't this a conversion? Is this a is this an acceptance of more than just um, family?" rules and who can marry who but doesn't this require to some extent them becoming jewish now what's interesting about this is we throw out this possibility what if these people are allowed to convert and become jews essentially through circumcision now that's a big what if let's hold let's hold on to that big what if because uh yeah, it just sounds like when he's talking about you come circumcised you know with intermarrying and all that stuff that's just to me telling me we'll do that if you become a you know circumcision meaning to be a Hebrew. So so Mike's point is this sounds like conversion. Like this is this is a step. I mean, this is the step they have to take in order to become Jewish so that they can become part of the, of the, the community. What's interesting about this is technically speaking, what Mike's saying is really true because it is true. Because as, as of this moment, right now, as of this moment. Right now, in Genesis chapter 34, there's only one mitzvah. We only have one mitzvah. It's circumcised. Right. We learned about that back with Abraham, right? That we are commanded, God commanded that they have to circumcise. As of now, according to the 613 commandments in the Torah, there's one commandment. Now, some people say that there's two commandments, though this one was a little murkier as a mitzvah, but it's definitely... Some people would say is a mitzvah, is one in Genesis. There's really only two commandments in Genesis. Some people say really only one that God says, thou shalt, or you should do this. We read it last week. We don't eat the thigh muscle, right? We don't eat the hind quarters, right? Because of Jacob losing his power of, in his leg, right? So that is that is no filet or, or sirloin or tri-tip, right? That's what we read last week. Now, what's interesting is... Isn't there a third there? But we haven't we haven't read that we have to keep Shabbat. I thought we did. No, because we only read that we only read that Shabbat. The 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 only thing we read about Shabbat was that God rested on the seventh day. It didn't say, interestingly enough, at that point. So Shabbat is definitely introduced, but as far as the commandment to keep Shabbat, we don't get that until Exodus. So some people say there's one commandment, which is circumcision. Some people say there's two commandments in all of Genesis. But one could make the argument that as of right now, there's one commandment, which is to get circumcised. So if, they, if there's going to be later on commandments, maybe they'll have to keep them. But as of right now, the only commandment you have to do to be a descendant of Abraham, the descendant of Jacob, is to follow the mitzvah of circumcision. So you can make the argument, yeah, when there are other commandments, you'll have to follow those too. But right now, that's the only commandment, being I mean, simply getting circumcised. It is so ridiculous to think that a whole a town full of men would agree to be circumcised so this one prince can have this woman. I mean, they, are they, I mean, it's so ridiculous. And, well, the, and the, 
because they what admired Jacob and his family so much, the uh, the nomads on the edge of town. Okay, so so you so the believability of this story is an interesting one, right? We don't know how many people live at this city, so let's say it's 100, 150. I will tell you right now. But how old are these men? Assume that they're all ages, right? right. They're, 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 there's, I would say circumcision older age. So is so Joanne yeah. saying it seems like it would be a little hard? Yes. Uh, let's, let's look at what happens. The words pleased Hamor and Hamor's son Shechem. And now the youth lost no time in doing the thing, for he wanted Jacob's daughter. Now he was the most respected in his father's house. So Hamor and his son Shechem went to the public place of their town, and it is their town. The, the note here is public place, literally the gate, right? The, the gates of the town. But they went to the Sha'ar, the, the, the town center, and said, these people are our friends. Let them settle in the land and move about it, for the land is large enough for them, and we'll take their daughters to ourselves as wives and give our daughters to them. But only on this condition will their representatives agree with us to dwell among us and to be one kindred, that all our males become circumcised as they are circumcised. Their cattle and their substance and all their beasts will be ours. If only agree to their terms so they will settle among us. So let's get back to your question then. There- okay, so maybe they don't have any food. Maybe they need, they want the cattle and the beasts. I mean, maybe they, we know that famine happens a lot. Yes. So, so your question originally was, would it really be, is it, is it really believable that these people could be convinced by one guy in town telling them they have to do this? I will first of all tell you, it's very interesting that you asked that question. The way you asked that question happened to be this week, because as we're seeing right now, there can be one, one person, one, one individual can wind up shaking up the whole world. And if you don't think that that's the case, ask people right now that are studying what's happening right now at this very minute in Ukraine and Russia. Ask that question of people who studied world history, especially when we've had video and the ability to actually study people. Forget 200 years ago or 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago to think about how much bloodshed and how much carnage was started by one idiot who liked one woman and one woman who he wanted to be his wife. I mean, that's the story, right? That's the great story of, of Helen of Troy, right? There's a whole right. war that's fought over a, a, over a queen. But again, if somebody gets something in their head that they have to do it, how many other people die because somebody decides that they want to exert their power? So it's interesting that you say that today because we're definitely thinking about that. But you also now raise this other point, which I think is something that our sages pointed out which is that there is something sweet in the pot here. And the way that the way that Hamor and Shechem bring this news to the people, and it says Hamor and Shechem did it together. So it's the father and the son do this. They said, look, we'll be able to marry their women. Okay, so what? We're maybe getting some extra women. But, but of course, in that, it's also that we have to give them our women, right? So... We have to do that. But they said, but there's a condition. And now you can imagine this negotiation where they're going and telling all the men of the town, however many guys it is, this is what we have to do. But only on this condition that we that their males are circumcised. And you can imagine here at this point where the guys are all shaking their head, going, are you crazy? We don't need this. And that's when Shechem and Hamor hit him with that, which is the cattle and the substance and all their beasts will be ours. If only we agree to their terms so that they will settle among us. And the rabbis point out very rightly that the people were not going to do it until that point, until this final sweetening of the deal. And what the rabbis point out is that now we actually see that Shechem and Hamor are not good people. Because what they say is not that we get to share property with them or that we get to do business with them but that their cattle and their substance and their beasts will be ours. And so what do these guys look at it like? And what are they trying to tell their people? We can take advantage of these people if we bring them into our community. Their stuff becomes our stuff. And that's what he just said. He just, or they just told them, we can take their stuff. And maybe everything is okay, 
You could say, well, they're just trying to fix the situation. Now they just reveal their true colors, according to at least one possible reading of this, which is the actual text. Their stuff will be ours. That's what they just said. Not that we get to share their stuff, and then we'll have to share their stuff with them, which is what they've been saying up until now. We give them our daughters, they take our daughters, and we, they give us our, their daughters, and everybody gets a little something. Here, it's we get to take their stuff. And, and we know from Jacob's life that he's good at raising cattle and making sheep. A lot of stuff. So he's probably like, yeah, has a substantial amount of, um, of cattle and, um, and, and animals. Yep. So this deal now looks a lot better and it makes these two guys look a lot worse. Because now they've just said we get to take from them. Not that we're going to give them anything in return, by the way, right? It doesn't say that their cat, it's not that our cattle and our substance will be theirs and their cattle and substance will be ours. It's their cattle and substance will be ours. That's what they just said. All his fellow townsmen, he did Hamor and his son Shechem, and all the males and all his fellow townsmen were circumcised. So they went through with it. This is verse 24. Verse 25. On the third day, when they were in pain, Shimon and Levi, two of Jacob's sons, brothers of Dina, took each his sword and came upon the city unmolested and slew all the males. Two guys. Now, there is an understanding that it wasn't just the two guys, because that seems a little far-fetched, unless they're like superheroes, which there's an understanding that maybe they do have super strength. <laughs> Can they kill that many guys? Would, would they be able to get away with it, even if they're all suffering? Well, maybe. There is an understanding that maybe they took their crews, right? So Shimon and Levi, like all the sons, have a group of guys with them. Naftali has a group of guys. They have a group of guys. Um, and it's possible, but that's not what it says. It says that two guys each took their swords, literally, and did it. Is it possible that they took a, each one took their crew of guys too? Maybe. The point is, is that they went and killed all the men. That's what it says. They came upon the city and killed all the men. Well, wait, let's look. They put Hamor and his son Shechem to the sword, took Dina out of Shechem's house, and went away. She never, according to this, left. Now, it is also possible that once they got circumcised, that's when they brought her back. But we don't know that. It's very possible that she never left. We don't know. But she leaves now. And Shimon and Levi are Dina's full brothers, right? They're all children of Leah together. So maybe they felt a little bit more kinship with Dina than the other brothers. Judah and Reuben are the other, well, there's, you know, God and Asher. I mean, there's other brothers that are part of the Leah tribe, tribes. But the four oldest brothers are. Reuben, Shimon, Levi, and Judah. So the two middle guys, Judah and Reuben, are not here. Shimon and Levi are. And remember, those two tribes, as we talked about yesterday, they wind up with no property at the end of the story, by the way. During the time of King David, by the time of King David, Shimon and Levi don't have any property. Well, Levi doesn't need any property because he's the priesthood and he gets a little bit of everything. Hey, fine, but he has no property. Shimon has no property either, though. And that's a little suspicious. He gets completely subsumed by the brother tribe Judah. They, 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 Shimon just gets completely subsumed and overrun by Judah. They, they become completely mixed with them. The point is, is that it's interesting that neither one gets a tribe. And later on, there is an accounting, if some, to some extent, in the way Jacob feels about his, these two sons. But anyways, um, they took their sister and they went. So they didn't leave her there. They took her. They do not ask her. We do not hear her voice at all in the entire story. I'm not going to ruin it. Well, we're almost done. She doesn't say anything. Jacob, as you noticed, has not said a word yet either. Jacob has said nothing so far. They went. 
And the word there again is the Bayatsu, which is they went, they left. Same word, Yatsa, they went. And it says, the other sons of Jacob came upon the slain, plundered the town because their sister had been defiled. They seized the flocks and herds and asses, all that was inside the town and outside, all their wealth, all their children, all their wives, all that was in the houses, and took his captives and booty. So just so you know, where did the other brothers come in? They came in to clean up everything else. They took everything else. Shimon and Levi don't seem to be concerned with anything other than vengeance. Reality is they don't. And getting Dina. They don't take anything. They take their, yeah, they take their sister back. They leave a bunch of dead bodies and then pull, pull their sister out. So you can imagine what was going on in her mind while this was happening. Was she calm? I mean, we can imagine it. I mean, I know that we have an answer. Was she, did she feel vindicated? Did she feel that her brothers, you know, stood up for her? I, I mean, I don't know. There's definitely different ways of reading the story. But it's interesting that they didn't take any possessions and they end up with no possessions, but the brothers who took possessions end up with possessions. Uh-huh. And let's read what happens because the story is almost over. Jacob said to Shimon and Levi, you have bought, brought trouble on me, making me odious among the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Parasites. My fighters are few in number. So if they unite against me and attack me, I and my house will be destroyed. So Jacob finally says something to, J to Shimon and Levi. He doesn't, say, he doesn't say anything to the other brothers. He says it to Shimon and Levi, the, the guys are responsible for killer. And he doesn't say... He doesn't say you shouldn't have taken vengeance. He said, you made me look bad and I can't deal with the publicity. I can't deal with the effects of the publicity. I can't, I don't have enough people to deal with these other people. If they decide to now go on and attack me. So it doesn't say what they did was necessarily evil or necessarily wrong, but it, he basically says, you didn't think about the consequences of what this is going to do. And so Jacob finally speaks out. Hold off on your comment, because I do want to hear what people say about this, because we have to read the end. This is right coming right now. But they answered, should our sister be treated like a whore? Folks, that's the last word of the story. I'm not, I just showed you the beginning of chapter 35. The last word is, should our sister be treated like a whore? That's the last word. It's more poetic or more beautiful in Hebrew. Uh, Mary, why don't you lay down on us the King James on that? Shouldn't she deal with our sister as with a harlot? This is a little bit more forceful. It's a little bit more. It's a, it's a little bit more. It's a little bit more uh, the word and the words that we use today. And the connotation here, I don't know that a lot of us are using the word harlot anymore, but harlot almost has a connotation that some old English guy is telling someone that they're playing the harlot, like they're really not a harlot, right? It's almost like a word you'd use when you're trying to be, make someone feel bad about their behavior. Whereas this is, the guy treated our sister like a whore. In Hebrew, it's a little bit more powerful, by the way, too, to, to some extent, just because of the, the way Hebrew lays it out. Uh, because the last word in here is our sister. Because you know, it, because you end with the with the with the now our sister. He treated our, you know, he made our sister, or he made he turned, you know, her into a whore, our sister. I mean, that's kind of the way it is in Hebrew because there's a power to, to finish it with the last word, our sister. The last word in Hebrew would be our sister. That's what we're left with, our sister. Achotenu. Not with the word whore, which is, whoa. I mean, that's like a, I mean, that's a really powerful way to translate it. Uh, but it's a dramatic way of, uh, it's an angry way of translating it. It could also be prostitution with our sister. You're getting back to the way that they really felt, which is that she's our sister. 
And uh, to me, the Hebrew way, the Hebrew language actually, and again, to some extent, it's because of the structure of the Hebrew language, it actually conveys more of the protection and the love that they have for their sister, the honor that they feel their sister deserves. Yeah, you know, the the, the Zona feels like, um, and they said that, that she was made into a, a prostitute, which um, also feels like, because you get paid after sex for being a prostitute, right? As opposed to being paid before for being a wife. Yeah. So they made, he made her into a prostitute. Yeah, but there's definitely a connotation here. And there are two words for, for prostitute in the Bible that are sometimes used not necessarily interchangeably, but with intention. That uh, a Kadesha is a cultic prostitute. It's a woman who is doing a job of having cultic prostitution. And what? Cultic, a cultic prostitute. If you will, a sacred sexual nun. I know it's weird, but we, we have essentially created the bri a bride of Christ is a way of desexualizing what was very much a part of the ancient pagan world which were there were women who were engaged in sex on behalf of the deity or deities and so that's what uh kadesha is a zona is a is a street robber is a prostitute is a whore is a woman who gets paid for sex i mean uh, doing it for a reason for, for gods but because that's her job but who told her that that's what do you mean? Who told her that she's doing this? Uh, Kadesha? Oh, I mean, we assume that when the word is used in the Bible, when the, when the Bible is using that word, it's a different role. We're going to see it, by the way, in three chapters, just so you know. We're going to have a great story where Judah ends up sleeping with his own daughter-in-law, thinking that she's a cultic prostitute. This story is weird enough that, and violent enough, and is you know, I don't want to introduce too much in here, but we have two very shocking sexual stories within within four chapters of each other. But what happens here is we're left with, think about who gets the last word. It's not Jacob. Jacob did not get the last word. The sons did. The brothers did. Jacob doesn't answer. There's no answer. And it's beautiful that the last word is, is our sister, I do think that um, I would have translated it as prostitute because horrors like they could sleep with anybody without getting paid, a lot of people without getting paid, whereas she slept with one person and then they suggested paying her afterwards as opposed to um, offering the bride price and then marrying her. The version that I'm looking at does say prostitute. Yeah, I like prostitute better than whore. Uh, well, they definitely wanted you to be there definitely was a sense of anger, uh, anger here. Why should they be angry when they killed all the men? When they first told them to get circumcised, they get circumcised and they get killed. Well, what's interesting about this, there is no question that Shimon and Levi are not forgiven by their father for what they did. Even on his deathbed, he's still angry. Right. But... There is a real question of whether what Shimon and Levi do is disproportionate or do they have to fix the problem? Because there is a sense here, I will tell you, friends, that the rabbis have that Jacob doesn't do the right thing. Jacob never should have been in a negotiation with his daughter. That Jacob never should have let his daughter out in the first place. That Jacob didn't do anything to really calm his sons down that Jacob essentially sets this up to be a tragedy in the making by what he has done up until this point. And that Jacob- he hasn't said. What? what? We're not doing anything. We're what not doing anything. He hasn't said, saying nothing. Yes, and more importantly, by even letting the negotiations go on the way they did. Because, because to some extent, there's a feeling maybe here in the text and definitely as people have read this over time, that Jacob never should have gone in, there never should have been a negotiation. Now, you could make the argument that he should have come up with some way to get his daughter back, because especially if Dina is not there, what's he going to do? Go in there and kill everybody? They can't do that. They're, they can't get into the city, first of all, 
They can't get through the gates to kill everybody. But should the guile have been essentially to get their sister back or did they have to kill everybody? So that's really the question at some point. I mean, you could, their argument would be we had to kill them because if we just take our sister back, maybe these guys are going to attack us. We really well, I mean, that was the only way to get their sister But sister aside, if they had agreed to it, then these, these, um, this, um, these people would have come in and taken all of Jacob's sheep and cattle and everything for themselves, right? So it's almost like Jacob's ego got that this this king and this prince wanted to sit down with him and negotiate for the daughter like um was his ego was so big that he didn't see the the danger that they would actually agree to this and then take everything that he owned and his family and everything um for themselves so i think when the brothers then uh, make this this thing and go in and take and they they turn the tables they take everything for themselves and they get their sister back Yes. In the earlier, though, they might have been telling the Canaanites to be circumcised so they would have an opportunity to go in and slay them and get their sister back. Well, it seems like that's at least a possibility. What Mike says is that this was their goal all along. But was their goal all along, and maybe Jacob, and you can make the argument that Jacob only feels, Jacob at this point, when he says, oh, my sons have, are tricking them into all getting circumcised, because then what they're going to do is while they're recovering, they're going to go in and take her back. So you could say that maybe Jacob goes, I mean, I'm just, you don't have to say this, but you could say that one of the reasons why Jacob allows this is because he doesn't see, he doesn't see Shimon and Levi going in and killing everybody. He just sees them going in and taking the daughter, you know, Dina back because they're all recovering. Because he could, look, if they can go in and kill everybody, he could have gone in there and taken the, the Dina without killing everybody. I mean, he didn't have to kill everybody to get Dina. Or he could have just killed Shechem and Hamor. I mean, no. the point is, is that if he could get in there, once they could get in there, and it says they got in there unmolested, that at that point they could have taken their sister and said, we're going home. No, sorry, there is no marriage. But you could also make the argument that the people of Shechem would have said, we made a deal. We did what you said. We, you you got to live up. You. So look, we don't know what, what their end game is. We don't know what Jacob was thinking. Here's the interesting thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I said. Yeah. So the only way to guarantee that Dina stays stay safe is to kill them. Right. That could be their understanding that if we I don't mean, kill them, fair. we don't stop them, then they're gonna they're gonna come back and get her again. So you could say that it really they really don't have a choice. But they weren't thinking because what Jacob is saying is now they can all come after us, you know, the Canaanites and the parasites can join up and, and come after us. Yes, and so so again, if you didn't hear what Mike said, is that now Jacob's lo- so so if if Shimon and Levi are thinking about the long term, which is that we better kill them, otherwise they're going to come and take our sister again, and all our stuff, and our stuff. Jacob actually said, "No, you didn't think this out. Like if you're playing chess, you thought two steps in advance. You got to think four steps in advance because what's going to happen when everybody else says these Jacob and his family they're crazy killers. Let's just kill them. Who needs these crazy people here?" They're nuts. They just killed the whole city. We got to get mean, rid of these people. And that's what Jacob says. You made me odious. You've made me number one target here in town. So he actually says, you do not think this out. Now, I feel like Jacob might have, have taken all of this negotiation um, and wanted this to happen, but the sons were the ones that doing the guile, not Jacob. Jacob might have thought, yes, okay, they're all going to convert. And we're, it's, we're all going to be a part of this big you know, town. And the sons were like, no, nah, that's not how this is going to go down. Because maybe the sons had a better idea that, that the village people were going to come and take all of their stuff. Look, so- <laughs> the village people. <laughs> Jacob, that's not those village people. No, Jacob, Jacob, there's a, there's a, there's a Native American and a police guy. No, the, there was a problem here, which is that did Jacob know that this was what was going to happen anyways. Now, there's a feeling that Jacob- I don't think so, because he wouldn't have been so mad afterwards. That's that's why you have to kind of think that he didn't expect this to happen. There is an understanding that because Jacob keeps his mouth shut and doesn't do anything and waits for his sons to come, that he's essentially 
he's essentially knows that they're going to take care of business and he can blame them. So is the long game, and this is what some people say, that Jacob actually played the long game here, and at least with his own family and with the reputation that he just laid out to everybody, it's not on me, it's on the sons. Now, before you think that that's not a possibility, understand that Jacob very well could have said, I had nothing to do with this. You did it. Could Jacob have done that? It's very possible that Jacob just did that. I thought he stopped being a jerk after he met his, up with his brother again. I will tell you, there is not a real sense that Jacob has figured things out completely. That for all of his cleverness, all of his guile, all of his tricks, that he's always going to be the one who's going to get tricked in the end, right? Because he does get tricked by his sons. What he just did, at the very least, is open up the possibility that his sons are going to mess with him throughout, throughout the rest of his life, which we know that they do. We know that they do that with his story with Joseph. What he's done now by giving his sons the last word is the possibility that Jacob has now just shown himself to have no control over them. They can do whatever they want now. Which well, they, uh, they do. I mean, they, they take what they do to poor Joseph. Is... So do the sons now have, number one, not they no longer have confidence in their father's ability to lead. But they also, because that's a possibility, was Jacob playing them the whole time and letting them do the damage so that he didn't do anything. He never said anything. He can, he can completely wash his hands from this and say, hey, my sons did this. I didn't give him any permission to do it. I mean, all of those are possibilities here. And I will tell you that they are all possibilities because of what we read the rest of the text. We definitely get a sense that Jacob does have resentment for what Shimon and Levi do. Is it a justification? Gets back to Mike's original question, which is when was this written? Who wrote this? Who, who wrote this? Because if Levi, the original Levi did this, then the rest of the Levites have as their ancestor this guy who seems to be pretty impulsive, pretty, pretty temperamental, can get a little angry at times. And we know that one of those descendants is Moses, who can sometimes get a little angry with people. He can throw commandments around. He can let the Levites go and kill everybody after the, after the golden calf incident. The Levites oftentimes show a certain amount of violence, propensity to violence, which is interesting because they're supposed to be priests. But they also seem to maybe have been priests because if they weren't priests, they would have gone absolutely crazy. So the Levites, the Levites seem to maybe be priests by order of, if we don't keep them worshiping God occasionally, they'll go off the deep end every time somebody gets out of hand. And that is a possibility. And it is a possibility, as I've told you before, if we follow the understanding that the Levites as a tribe couldn't be given a, 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 a tribal portion because they would have just taken everyone else's tribal portion and they would have just invaded the other ones. So by not giving them a portion, by putting them in everyone else's portion, they essentially dilute them. Uh, it's a possibility. Uh, we do know that the Levites obviously play an important role in the rest of the history of, of Israel and that they're one of the only tribes that we still can identify, right? It's only the Levites and the Kohanim is part of the Levites and, it, and Judah, that we actually can say these tribes still exist. So it, it is an interesting story uh, because there is a, it gets back to that question of who wrote this and why do we have this story. Um, it definitely shows that, um, that families, the family dynamic, the way it plays out, um, that sometimes um, the, the relationship between and again, God forbid anyone has a situation like this where they have to deal with rape, they have to deal with avenging, you know, they have to avenge a family honor or any of these kind of things. The bottom line is, is that families oftentimes have a dynamic where a son or sons assume power from their father before the father is ready to give up that power. And at the end of the day, the end of this story, boom, what happened? The sons get the last word. Jacob doesn't say anything. So Jacob, like one line, right? yeah, Jacob has very little power, very little to do in this story, in this whole story. 
And, and I do think that more than anything, this shows a shift in balance, a balance of power shift from, the, from Jacob to his sons. Maybe, and maybe he doesn't want the responsibility. Maybe. 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 What? We see it again later on with the sons taking advantage of Jacob. Yeah. So when the sons take advantage later of Jacob, uh, you know, it's consistent with this. What's interesting is the only son who doesn't seem to take part in this, well, Benjamin hasn't been born yet, so that son, is Joseph. Joseph's too young. Joseph is too young to have really taken part in this. So Joseph didn't take part in this. Oh, I can say. Um, yep. And so Joseph's role later on as a son that Jacob loves and favors and feels a connection with could have something to do with this story and the fact that at this point now Jacob feels Jacob now feels that he's lost control of his sons. The sons are going to do what they want to do now and he can't stop them. I mean, look, his, his answer is a fair answer, which is we can't afford to make enemies here. There, the, he's speaking from a completely pragmatic and logical place. By the way, also relevant to us right now. I mean, you hear it all the time. Let's bomb this 40-mile convoy of, of Russian cars and tanks and, and missiles that are making their way to Kiev. We say that, but pragmatically, rationally, we're like Jacob saying, we don't want to start World War III. And so when somebody says, well, we got to do something, we got to bomb it, then people say, well, really, are you going to start this? And so Jacob really is kind of the way, the pragmatic side of us, which is, no, you can't do that. And then there's this side, which is the brother side, which is, there's justice, there's vengeance. You can't let this happen. And they actually get the last word. The last word in this story is, you do the right thing, Jacob. You don't wait around. So it's interesting because there is a real, real relevant question here, which is, can you operate without logic, without consequences, without rational behavior and rational you know, thinking about the consequences, or can you do? Can you? Can but you, you can't let fear of consequences stop you from doing the right thing. At what point? At what point? Jacob is saying, "We are all dead now. We are dead men now." If and, there's no laws, what are they going to do? It's, it's vengeance. Of course, you now have created a blood for blood. Eye for eye situation. What are you going to do? When the no, there's nobody, I mean, there's nobody left in that town. I mean, just the outside people, if they, if they hear about it and, and maybe they hear about it and they think, I don't want to mess with those people. I mean, they wiped out all the men, took all the women, children and, and, and booty for themselves. Um, they're pretty formidable. Well, you can make the argument that Sarah's making here, which is that Jacob's family just made themselves known. You don't mess with us. And now they're the biggest ones in town. Right. Well, we don't. We don't. Town. Hey, listen, Jacob doesn't feel that way, by the way. So you could say that, yeah, their answer is no one's going to mess with us now because we'll just kill you all and take your all your property. We'll take your, we'll kill God you wants. and we'll take your women and children. That is not, I, 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 don't, I don't understand. I understand what they did. Why they did it, but I don't understand it because God was not wanting. So they kill all they're still the children. So so the answer especially the, once they were circumcised. Oh, they an, were Jewish, right? Once they were circumcised. Yes, Jewish, you're right, Doreen. Then they killed their Doreen, Jews. Doreen, there's no question. There will be Good. very no, nice no. <laughs> no no, there'll be very nice Russian young men that are 19 or 20 years old. Somewhere around 2,000 of them, supposedly, according to the Ukrainian, 7,000 are already dead in Ukraine. Nice kids had no idea when they woke up two months ago or three months ago that they'd be now dead in Ukraine. 
So yeah, innocent people, nice people, people who get caught up with the wrong, on the being on the wrong side, it happens all the time. But the thing that, the point I hope you realize what I'm trying to say is they were Jewish when they they Interesting. Oh. So, so Doreen says is once they're circumcised, aren't they Jews? Then they well, killed. That, that, that was their whole so argument. So here's the interesting thing: the argument that the rabbis make on this is that these people have proven themselves to be not good people because the only reason why they agreed to be circumcised was to take our stuff. But and so, what is the great karma? What's the great karma? We took all their stuff. I know, but they got killed and we took all their I, stuff. I wish they hadn't asked them to get circumcised because they did make them Jews. I, 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 listen, I know, I, Dory, you're absolutely right. But the, rap, the rabbinic answer here is the only reason why the guys agreed to do it was because they t because Hamor and Shechem said, we get all their stuff. Bring them in here and we'll get all their stuff. Now, look, if the Torah didn't leave that, if the Torah didn't have that part, that part wasn't there, you could say, yeah, this is terrible. These people are. These people are innocent victims. Well, they, they're still innocent. What's interesting about this story, you know, you can think about it this way. Think about it this way. Those women and children that the rest of the guys just brought back, meaning Naftali and Dan and Asher and all those other guys, took all that stuff and brought them back and brought all those women and children back. According to the Torah, all those people are all mixed up with us right now. So they're our ancestors, the women and children, and the men that were complicit in the act of taking, they were complicit by getting the circumcision. They get the circumcision, that's their like agreement that they're willing to give up that piece of skin so that they can take somebody else's stuff. Yes. Now, what I said before, though, is not something that people have oftentimes thought about. The women and children of Shechem were the innocent victims. Normally we'd say, well, yeah, they got killed in battle too. Could have been. There are battles in the Torah where everybody gets wiped out. The Amalekites all got wiped out a couple weeks ago in our Tuesday morning class. Men, women, children, animals, everything. They were all supposed to be killed. A couple of them live. They're not supposed to, right? The king of God lives, not supposed to. Everyone's supposed to be killed. Folks, right now, just think about this. The Torah told us that we are partly the descendants of the people of Shechem who survived, the survivors of Shechem. We are those people too. And again, people don't talk about that. Our ancestors, very, I don't know if there's even a midrash about that, what happened to those people. But their blood, those women whose husbands and fathers were murdered in Shechem. The brothers did exactly what they said they were going to do. Yep. They, they were going to take their wives um, their women and their daughters for wives. They yep. didn't. They didn't um, speak falsely. They just didn't say that they were also going to slaughter the men. So, so remember that's what they proposed, though, Sarah. That was their proposal. No, yeah, but the the the, the brothers responded with like you know um, that they were um, that if they got if they got the circumcision. Then they would go ahead and exchange and, and take what, their their daughters for their wives. There it was their did. it was their proposal. The, the, it was the Shechemites who originally proposed this, right? It was they, their proposal, right? And then their response wasn't it like, um, okay, get the circumcision, and then we'll take your daughters for our wives. Yeah, right. So they did that. I'm just saying. They technically didn't lie. They just didn't mention that they were going to slaughter all the sons. It's it's a it's a. Um, what were you going to say? Then we will give our okay. So they didn't say we'll give our daughters to you, and take your daughters to ourselves, and we'll dwell among you. Okay, so they didn't just say we'll take your daughters. <laughs> <laughs> they did imply they'd keep them alive. <laughs> Had to check. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, Sarah can't hear him, so yeah, yeah Mike. Sarah can't hear me. Well, is that this was all a ploy by Shimon and Levy. They get circumcised, and when they're recovering, they're going to go in and they're going to do anything they can to save their, their sister. But in this case, they killed them all to get it to them. And that's my feeling is what happened. Is that? Is that the, the get circumcised thing? It was all a plan. Let's, let's get together. Let's say you have to get circumcised. 
while they're recovering from the circumcision, they're going to go get their daughter because they think their daughter is being kidnapped. And so they're going to do anything they can to save their, their sister. And that's my feeling. Okay, so. Kill a whole population. Yeah. So, so I'm going to do whatever I can to save my sister. So, so here's an interesting thing. Here's an interesting thing. It was all of the sons who originally speak, right? It says yeah. Jacob's sons answered them. And it was only on this condition. It's all, it's well, all. See, I think they all got together because Shimon Levy goes in first and then the second wave comes in and takes, takes, takes the woman. Which is a possibility. There's another possibility, which is that they were, Shimon and Levy never told the rest of the brothers, we're going to kill everybody. You hear what, what, uh, what Jacob says later, it sounds like maybe that's what it was, but. So was the plan by the rest of the brothers to come in and, I mean, it's only Shimon and Levi who go in and do it. So did they just decide, hey, we're going to, this is the way we're taking care of business? Or, and did the rest of the brothers, after they already see everyone's dead, and then they just say, hey, we might as well just get everything. I mean, we don't really know. I mean, Shimon, Shimon and Levi don't take anything. Which is almost as if to say, we don't want any of your stuff. I'm just trying to, you know, make Doreen feel a little happy. <laughs> just, <laughs> when they, when they so, circumcised their Jews, and whether, whatever the reason was, they told them, when, you, when you're circumcised, you're like us. You're Jewish. Then they killed those Jews. So that, for me, it's like I wish there was a different way that they could have done it, or, or a different way to, to look at it, because they, in my mind, Yes, they were protecting their sister, their daughter, but they killed Jews. They made them Jews by asking them to get circumcised, and then they killed them. That's so, it's something I can't wrap my head around. It's interesting. So yeah, you... but like, why is it? Why does it matter if they're Jews or not? It, it's it's bad either way to like kill a bunch of to kill a bunch of people. I mean, because they're Jews, they don't deserve to die, but they would deserve to die if they hadn't been made Jews. Either way, you're going. Anything other than they, I would rather they just gone in and killed them all, just like as they were, and they yeah. be Jews. And yeah. So, so Doreen, so Doreen's, so Doreen's point is, is that it shouldn't have happened. At period. She wished it hadn't happened. Well, she wishes it didn't happen since they, they were Jewish. Yeah. I, I don't, I, I, don't, I, don't I don't think you'd like it to happen if it was. No, no, Jewish. I, I don't disagree with the concept of what they did. They were protecting themselves and this child. But why did they make them Jews first? Yeah. Well, I understand the concept. They were that's the way to get them down and, and yeah. out. But it's they did end up killing Jews. Yeah, but we shouldn't be more offended because they're Jews. I, I no, but I think I think what Doreen's saying is the bot the net effect of them becoming Jewish is what bu is what bugs her because in order for them to be killed, essentially they had to become Jews in order to be killed. Well, Th that's the ir the irony of it is that is that they're because killed they as Jews. Yes, she says. I mean, she she understands that. She's just saying that it's tragic, the only and heavily ironic that they were actually killed as Jews.